الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين. Uh, dear Dr. Dina, our guest of honor today in this Stack Distinguished Scholar Lecture. This is the number five uh, in this uh, in this year. I would like to welcome all our scholars, uh, students, lecturers, researchers who are participating here uh, in this room, Ibn Khaldun Conference Room, and also those brothers and sisters who are following us on the Zoom and in the YouTube channel. It's a great honor to have Dr. Dina with us here, who is an associate professor of the Faculty of Islamic Studies, University of Sarajevo, Bosnia. Uh, she is uh, specializing in these areas of Islamic studies, Islamic pedagogy, Islamic education. I think the, the topic of discussion today is very, very important. Uh, uh, very important to all of us here, the professors, the students, the researchers, because we are in the heart of Islamic studies. And talking about pedagogy, pedagogy and uh, uh, what they call Islamic studies education is something very important. Alhamdulillah, we are very glad that our Dr. Dina could make it and she is with us here today. I would like to thank our brothers, collaborators from Triple uh, IT on this uh, event, and also uh, Dr. Ayn, who is our uh, moderator for this session today. And once again, welcome all uh, to our fifth Distinguished Scholar Lecture at ISTAG here. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. Without further ado, may I uh, introduce our guests, our honorable guest for today, Dr. Dina, I don't know if I, I'm, uh, Sijam Hodzik Nadaravik is an associate professor at the Faculty of Islamic Studies of the University of Sarajevo uh, Department of Religious Pedagogy and Religious Psychology, Bosnia-Herzegovina. She teaches pedagogy, religious pedagogy, group of courses such as general pedagogy, general didactic, a methodology of teaching, religious instruction, religious pedagogy. And she is the head of the chair for religious pedagogy and religious psychology at the Faculty of Islamic Studies. She was a visiting scholar on the junior faculty development program, program managed and funded by the Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs of the U.S. Department of State at the Kent State University, Ohio, USA in 2010. And she is the author of three books and more than 20 academic articles in the field of pedagogy, theology, and religious pedagogy. So uh, without further ado, uh, may I um, let her, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for hosting me here at the ISTAC. Thank you, the Dean, Professor Dr. Bergut for inviting me to, to talk to your audience. Uh, it's my honor, real honor and pleasure to be today with you. As I told them at the entrance of the building, I have heard of this institution. I have read something. My colleagues who studied here in Malaysia were speaking about this and, and you, all of you. And I have just some experience uh, when it comes to the uh, meetings with, with Malaysian people, Malaysian scholars. I met some of you at the conference, first vir virtual conference that was hosted by International uh, Islamic University in Malaysia. And Professor Bergut, the, uh, the dean, was uh, moderator at that session, for that session in which I was participating. I also met some colleagues from the university uh, when participating in the Barzinji project. I don't know whether you heard of this project, Barzinji project. Um, in this project, during the pandemic time, several universities were participating. Shenandoah University from Virginia, 
Bridgewater College, uh, IIUM, and Sarajevo University. So through those uh, interactions, I met some colleagues and I will meet them inshallah here. <clears throat> Uh, I'm really glad to have an opportunity to talk to you, to uh, pass some experience and knowledge, and of course, to learn from you. I expect that also, to learn from you. My background is in Islamic theology and in pedagogy. Actually, those studies are separated studies. Islamic theology um, is studied at the Faculty of Islamic Studies, from which I come and I teach there. And I also studied at the Faculty of Philosophy. It's a secular state university and faculty uh, in the field of general pedagogy. <clears throat> so our educational system is quite different from your system here at the International University of Islamic University in Malaysia. So we don't have International Islamic University in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Our university uh, faculties are part of state universities. And we were not a member of the state university previously. We got this membership in 2003. We were affiliated member of the university. And now we are full member of the state university, secular university. So uh, the founder of Islamic uh, uh, Faculty of Islamic Studies, the founder is, is Islamic community in Bosnia Herzegovina, and we are operating under the state university. Did you understand this position? Yes. <clears throat> okay, thank you very much. The topic you suggested. Is quite wide, but I will try to cover it somehow. Effective pedagogy for Islamic studies. Very interesting questions. What is effective pedagogy for Islamic studies and value education? When it comes to the question about the values in education, it is recognized widely that many modern societies are facing with the problem of the erosion of values today. And what is the reason? What could be the reason for such erosion of the values, universal values? Is it the lack of informations? No, actually, it is not the lack of information because informations are available to almost all people today in the world. There should be some other reasons. Um, those crises of evaluation of, of values actually are largely attributed to the violence today, some social problems, actually the damaged family relationships also. It's also the cause of the erosion of the values. We have some other problems in the world today, we can see that today in Palestine, we have wars, we have uh, ecological crises, we have some other problems. And those harmful, harmful effects could be seen in the society, in education, but also in the person, at the person, because this could lead to the various forms of the destruction when it comes to the personality. So unfortunately, today we witness a lot of violence, a lot of attacks, murders, domestic violence, and so on. So there is need to speak about the value education. In my presentation today, I'll try to cover these topics, value and value education, but shortly because there is not enough time to, to go into details, uh, deeper into details. Sources of values in Islam, characteristic of Islamic pedagogy or education approach versus Western secular approach. Affirmation of universal values through Islamic pedagogy and education. 
Effective pedagogy approaches, strategies in the affirmation of values. I will give some examples and the role and opportunities of higher Islamic studies, the affirmation of values. In the Western academic literature articles and so on, we can find so many definitions and divisions, classifications of values, value educations, determinations of value educations. Uh, and the construct of value education can be found in the literature under various terms, such as moral education, character education, or ethical education. Very rarely, when it comes to the classifications of the values, we find this value, transcendence or holiness as a value. Very rarely, it is recognized as a value. That's why I just uh, came up with this classification and I will show you another classification that's for me uh, important because it put emphasis on the transcendence as a value. Education for values helps students to overcome prejudice, discriminations, and other unethical actions and attitudes. Encourages them to search for meaning and purpose in life. We know that uh, most of the Quran deals with the values and moral issues of human life. And the central topic, the central theme in the Quran is to believe and to go to go to do good deeds. When it comes to the top terms that are used in the Quran for doing good deeds and uh, implement values, we find these terms: Hayrun, Salihun, or Salihatun, Ma'rufun, Hasanatun, Tayyibun, and Birrun. These are terms that are most represented in the Quran when it comes to the good deeds. Uh, just in the opposite, we find other terms that refer to something that's evil, bad, bad deeds, such as sharrun, su'un, habisun, sayyi'etun, and fesadun. Of course, this is just an illustration. All universal values are affirmed, promoted in the Quran, in the Quran, and of course in the Sunnah. We find many topics, pedagogical topics, themes in the Quran. We can identify them and those values related to the pedagogical themes. For example, the Quran describes the human nature. The human nature, for example, is curious. What does it mean to be curious? It's a part of our nature to be curious and to have a will to learn, to study. Otherwise, we would not succeed as a humankind if we don't have this act in our nature. And we should see that, uh, for example, from the dialogue between Musa salam, and Hidr, do you know that story, of course, but what does that show us? It shows that the human nature is very curious. Musa salam, promises that he will not ask Hidr about the things that he is doing unusual according to the Musa's understanding, unusual, very unusual. But every time when he promises, he breaks the promise. Is that correct? Because of what? Because of his curiosity. Of course, we have different interpretations of this story, but the curiosity of Musa Salam also Ibrahim salam, when he asks about the uh, how how Allah revives the creatures, he asks, 
and Allah Jalashanuhu asks him, don't you believe? But he replies, no, it's just to calm my heart. Musa salam, also wanted to see Allah, to see God, and he wanted to, to speak to him, to talk to him. It's a curiosity, human curiosity. And there are also some other topics when it comes to the pedagogy. In the Quran, we can identify many topics, but I will mention some of them. For example, uh, educational or upbringing styles, we could also identify in the Quran, educational methods and educational styles, approaches. What dominates in the Quran? Which approach is recommended to be dominated when it comes to the upbringing and education? Is it sanction, discipline, or encouraging? Encouraging pupils, kids, people to, to believe, to value, to, to implement some values. You know the Quranic verse, I am just paraphrasing, summarizing, when Allah Jalashan who said to the Rasul Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, by God's mercy, you are merciful to them. If you are harsh or rude, all of them will run away from you. You should be polite, you should, you should be very calm, and so on and so on. Advise them very nicely. Use beautiful words when advise people and so on. It means that this approach should dominate in upbringing and education. We could also find some verses that direct us towards the uh, treatment of people who have some developmental disabilities. We should treat them on the best way, very nicely, and so on and so on. So we find many topics related to the pedagogy, to the education and upbringing in the Quran. What are the basic characteristics of Islamic pedagogy or education approach Western, uh, versus Western secular approach? I would like to hear from you something first. What do you think? What is the basic, basic differentiation between Islamic pedagogy and Western secular pedagogy? Could you maybe contribute just to interact a little bit? Anyone? The worldview, yes very different worldview. I will give you just some and explain some of the characteristics. As your colleague, our colleague said, our worldview, that's right. And also specific goals of Islamic education and upbringing. There are many definitions or yeah, of the goals of Islamic education and upbringing. One of them is that we should, through Islamic education and upbringing, Respect, tahkik, it means respect the haq, the right of everyone, and act according to that. The first haq that must be respected, it is God's haq. William Chitik also gave very interesting definition of the goals of Islamic education. He wrote that education served serves the needs of the human soul in its quest to return to God in the best possible way. And we should follow the three basic principles of Islamic thought, the unity of God, Tawheed, Nubuwa, and return to God, to God, El Merad. You are much more familiar with the teachings and other understandings of this topic by Al-Atas. 
but he said that seeking knowledge in Islam is to produce a good man. And he makes differentiation between good man and good citizen. You know that. But I can tell you that we had some discussions at our faculty when we invited some Western philosophers and educators. They reacted on this because they told, uh, I don't, we don't know. Of course, some of them, some of them were familiar. They knew about Atta's stance on this topic. And some of them reacted and told, no, it's not correct. We also, the aim of Western education is also to produce good men, <laughs> good men. But of course, we can speak here about the good men or values, but in the name of what we differentiate it here. In the name of what? In the name of God or in the name of uh, money or job or what? And there is a differentiation. Zehra Alzira, he wrote a very interesting book. I'm sure that some of them read this book, Coolness and Holiness in Education, an Islamic Perspective. And this book was published by Triple IT, and I translated this book into Bosnian language. She states that Islamic upbringing and education in its conceptual framework needs to teach individuals to self-realization or the art of living to develop fully integrated personalities based on Islamic virtues, Purif purification of the soul through moral and ethical Quranic teachings, as well as sharpening the mind through reasoning and thinking about God's creation, the universe, thinking about oneself are the ultimate goals of Islamic teaching, learning and practice. Of course, there are many practical goals of religious pedagogy. And through religious education, we strive that each person develop sensors of religiosity and to build evaluation criteria based on Islamic principles and Islamic values. The purpose of religious education Islamic education is also manifested in qualitative changes in the cognitive, affective, spiritual, and motivational areas. The concept of tevhid is another basic characteristic when it comes to Islamic religious education. Most scholars believe that Tevhid belongs to human nature, and we know that it's Fitra. And the prophets, messengers, came to awaken human nature, to remind human beings, to remove the for forgetfulness that weakened human understanding of Tevhid. This knowledge is innate to every human being. However, to understand what this knowledge entails, human being need educator. Who is the educator? First, Allah, who taught Adam, Adam, alayhi salam, the names of the things. He, Allah, is the Hadi. And in Surah Fatiha, we pray, Ihdina sirat al mustaqeen Like the Latin word, educe, verb, educare, educatio, we find this in this Quranic verse. We pray to God, you know, to direct us toward the path, the right path. And we also need the teachers, moral teachers, who will be directing us to develop Islamic values and morals in our persons. <clears throat> Tevhid, according to Sayyid Hussein Nasr is viewed through two truths. First, the knowledge ca comes from God, who is the source and subject of knowledge, and also its supreme object. And secondly, the ethics is inseparable from the process of learning and knowledge. And 
you know, in Western secular approach, educational approach, we don't find this. The God is the main source of knowledge, you know. The reason, according to this secular approach, the reason is the source of knowledge, the nature and so on. But according to Islamic understanding, the God is the source of knowledge. Who is Al-Aql al awwal who is all-knowing, alim, al-alim, al-aklul awwal And our reason, our mind, cannot be separated from that al-aql al awwal You know, you, you understood this, and most probably you're familiar with this. <clears throat> but at the same time, this is important to mention, the concept of Tevheed, even though it, we, it, even though we implement the concept of Tevheed in our educational institutions, understandings, and so on, it doesn't mean that we should be, uh, that we should have, for example, unified curricula or unified practices. We could have of course, differentiated curricula, differentiated ideas, practices, and so on. We should be creative on that way. Holistic approach also is one of the basic characteristics when it comes to Islamic pedagogy and education, holistic approach. I understand this approach through at least three areas or directions. I have written an article that is published uh, in this year in Germany, in this book, Islam Unterricht im Discourse, because in Europe today, especially in Germany, uh, there is a tendency of establishing Islamic theological centers, you know that, and several Islamic centers are established at the, uni at the secular universities, at least five of them. And he, we at the Faculty of Islamic Studies in Sarajevo have kind of cooperations with those uh, Islamic centers in Germany. Uh, and this is very, I would say, relevant and very current discussion. Islam Unterricht, it's, it means Islamic religion in dialogue or discussions about religion, religious education. Uh, I understand wholeness in terms of the need of the development of all human potentials and abilities in order to develop, to create El Insan El Kamil. Islamic pedagogical approach recognizing the combination, you know, of cognitive, affective, and spiritual aspects of person's being. Akl, Ruh, and Kalb. And all of them should be integrated. Wholeness also, I understand wholeness in this term. Education should be for all human beings, for all human beings, irrespective of their age, social status, sex, and so on. Have you heard about uh, Jan Amos? Comenius, Jan Amos Comenius. Uh, he is regarded as one of the founders of the pedagogical discipline in the, in the West. He is one of the founders. He was living in the 16th century, 16th century. And at that time, when he came up with the idea, omnes omnia docenture, it means the right of everyone to be educated. It was something very re revolutionary in Europe at that time. You know, when he said omnes omnia docenture, the right of everyone, male and female, those from lower social uh, uh, class and higher social class. 
all of them have a right to be educated. It was revolution in Europe at that time. And of course, we find this, this, those principles in the Quran, in the Sunnah. We could speak about that for a long time, but this is something great, you know. And wholeness in terms of lifelong learning. We know the traditional concept of education was open to everyone. It was sponsored and supported by Vakuf, Vakf, by scholarships. And for me, it was very interesting to read that, for example, the traders in the bazaars, in the city, Bashtarshia, we say Charshia, in the city, they could come to Medresa and to learn some lessons, you know, to, to learn lectures, to hear the lectures, to attend the lectures. That uh, educational system, classical Islamic educational system was open to everyone. And it means that even those people who were old, elder traders and so on, could come and attend those lectures in madrasas. When it comes to the holiness, it is also one distinct, uh, uh, distinguished criteria when it comes to Islamic religious education and secular Western approach. Holiness means that it is an act of ibadat, ibadah, worship, piety. When I ask my students at my university, and I ask them, students, do you think, are you aware always are you conscious always? When you start to read, to study, to investigate, to write something, are you aware always that this is an act of piety, of ibadah? They tell me, but I, I say, please be honest. <laughs> be honest when answer this. They say, we are aware a little bit, but not all the time. And of course, through our pedagogical approaches and teaching and learning, we have to sensitively uh, remind students and ourselves that act of studying and learning is act of ibad, a worship piety act. Um, I was uh, watching one documentary uh, which was uh, prepared in England, and we can find that documentary movie uh, in, in internet. Um, I, I saw there's something very interesting for me. They, they were discussing about the reasons of decline when it comes to the uh, backwardness of Muslims in terms, in terms of the development of sciences today, because we know that classical thought and scholarship was very developed, especially during the golden age of Islam. And what were the reasons, or what are the reasons that Muslims how to, how somehow stopped to develop many sciences later on? Of course, there are some external reasons. We know that it's col colonial time and introducing secular educational systems in Muslim countries, and not only secular, but missionary also, and division between Islamic educational system and this secular educational system and, and missionary educational system. We know that it is external reason, but what, would, what could be internal reason, they ask? One of the eternal reasons for our backwardness, if we, if we could say, but maybe we could say, we could, we could think about that. Uh, there is an interpretation. It is said when Muslims understood that seeking the knowledge is ibadah, they were developing the sciences. But when they stop, stopped to understand the seeking of knowledge in the name of God, and when they stop to understand this as an, uh, an act of ibadah, they stop to develop the sciences. Mm -hmm. 
we see a human being that stands in a multiple relationship of in a multiple relationship to God first, to himself or to herself, to individual people, to other people, to human communities and to the nature. And in all these relationships, we should develop values and implement values, develop values in human being to act and react morally, ethically, in terms of our uh, behavior and religious duties toward God, to act ethically to ourselves, to, in, to other people, to human communities, and to nature. Uh, there are three main kinds of values. Ahlak, which refers to the duties and responsibilities to set out, set out in the Sharia and in Islamic teaching generally. Adab, which refers to the manners associated with a good upbringing and the qualities of character possessed by a good Muslim following the example of the Rasul Muhammad alayhi salam. Among the main differences between Islamic and Western morality are the emphasis on timeless religious principles, timeless religious principles, the rule of the law in enforcing morality, the rejection of moral autonomy as a goal and the moral education and the stress on reward in the hereafter as a motivator of moral behavior. <clears throat> How do we promote or affirm universal values through Islamic religious pedagogy and education? <clears throat> Of course, when, if, when we speak about these terms, re religious, Islamic pedagogy, education, there are different terms uh, today in which we operate uh, with those terms. Sometimes we meet the term religious education. Sometimes we meet the term Islamic education, sometimes Muslim education. There are various uh, terms that we use for Islamic pedagogy or Islamic education. When it comes to the Europe, uh, we use the term religious education. Religious education. Why? It is very important to mention here that religious education, uh, when it comes to, to the universities, is present in most European countries. Religious pedagogy is present uh, at most European universities as a part of the university. It is a study program that is integral with theology education. For example, uh, it is affiliated in Germany to some uh, theologies, Catholic theologies or other theologies. Religious pedagogy is a part of theology theology study program. It is always affiliated to the theology study program. Uh, in Bosnia and Herzegovina, we have the same situation. We have religious pedagogy department at my faculty, and also we have Islamic theology, and the third department is department for training imams. Why I am mentioning this religious pedagogy? Uh, during the communist time, religious pedagogy and religious education was not recognized as scientific academic discipline at all. It was not recognized as a scientific discipline. It was problematic. Why? Because when you don't have religious pedagogy recognized as a scientific field, academic field, it means the religious education should not be taught in the public schools. <clears throat> and at that time, during the communist time from 1945 until 1990s, we didn't have a religious education in public schools. Uh, I will be speaking about this topic, to, I think, tomorrow at the Kulia of Education, the, the structure or the concept of Islamic education in Bosnia and Herzegovina. 
but I will just give you here some few insights. Uh, Islamic education in Bosnia Herzegovina has a long tradition, long history. We started institutional uh, Islamic education started in the mid of the 15th century in Bosnia Herzegovina with the presence of the Ottomans at the time. And after that, almost after almost 500 years, Austro-Hungarian Empire conquered the region of Bosnia Herzegovina, and it was completely different cultural and civilizational framework. Western Catholic, first Islamic, and after that Western Catholic, and after that we had some other governments, Orthodox, and after 1945, the socialist time, communist regime, uh, was there, and at that time, all madrasas were closed in Bosnia and Herzegovina, with the exception of one madrasa. All madrasas were closed. And religious education that was present in the public schools, even during the Austro Hungarian time in Bosnia and Herzegovina, uh, it was expelled from the public space. Religion and religious affairs lost public status. And it was very problematic for us. And not only religious education in public schools <clears throat> was expelled, religious education, basic Islamic education in mektebs, those schools attached to the mosque were closely, closely controlled. You know, I experienced that also. I think that I am the last generation from the communist time. <laughs> My teacher at that time was, you know, communist, and she uh, didn't allow us to go to mektebs. She was teaching in, she was teaching me and my classmates in primary school, but she didn't allow us to go to mektebs. For example, if I go to mektebs, I, I was going actually. My parents were sending me to mektebs, but if she heard that I went to mektebs during the weekend, I would give. Uh, grade one in, in Bosnia, it means that it's unsatisfactory grade, you know, but she would give me, she would give me uh, one grade one for math, for language, for whatever I would give, I would get uh, that grade unsatisfactory. And it's a huge story. <laughs> we can discuss about that maybe late, later on, but uh, it is the situation. We went through very, very turbulent times. Various uh, frameworks when it comes to the government, political changes, social, social changes. And we had to adjust ourselves and Islamic religious education according to those turbulent changes, political, social, cultural ideologies, various ideologies and so on. Uh, it means <clears throat> at that time, religious education was not present in the public schools, in the public educational system. And believe me, you couldn't find in the textbooks from that time that religious education is one of the main areas of human development. We could find moral education, war uh, wo work, <laughs> work uh, education, uh, aesthetic education, uh, intellectual education, and physical education. We couldn't find religious education in the textbooks, main textbooks of pedagogy that were taught in the universities. We couldn't find this academic field or educational area present in the textbooks. So if we don't find there, we don't find in the public space also. So uh, this topic for us is still important because again and again, we have to approve that religious education is important for human development. Mm -hmm. maybe, maybe this is not an urgent topic here. I don't know. You, you, you don't need to confirm again and again to your authorities that religious education is very important, but we have to do that. <clears throat> Universally valid values, 
such as truth, beauty, justice, kindness, and holiness are very important. And my professor, I should mention here his name here, he is still alive, and he has recently published uh, the book, a very good book, The Pedagogy for Men. The Pedagogy for Men. Uh, from the man as a human being uh, to the uh, to the learning society. <clears throat> and he is a professor of general pedagogy, not of Islamic pedagogy. He was professor at the Faculty of Philosophy at the State Secular University. He was teaching pedagogy there. But we invited him to come to our faculty to teach some pedagogical courses. We should have some general pedagogical courses in our curricula in order to be teachers, religious teachers in public schools now, we have to have some general pedagogy courses such as pedagogy, didactics, methodology, psychology, general psychology, not Islamic, but general. Uh, it is a requirement to be teachers in order to get certificate to be religious teachers or other teachers. We should have those general pedagogical courses in our curricula. And we invited him, first of all, to help us. During the war in 1992 at the Faculty of Islamic Studies, I'm sure that you heard about the war, war of aggression and genocide in Bosnia and Herzegovina on the Muslim population. At that time, there was initiative. Could you imagine during the war time? after the oppression of religious identities during the communist time and the war started there was a great need people felt that they they would have they should have religious education in the public schools again so there was initiative of religious communities not only islamic but also catholic orthodox and jewish community in bosnia herzegovina to start again with a religious education in the public educational system. It was initiative of religious communities as well as parents. Parents also wanted their kids to be educated in the schools. <clears throat> so we had to establish the Department for Religious Pedagogy, religious, religious Education, because we didn't have that during the communist time. Uh, some Bosnian people, in order to pursue higher Islamic education, needed to go to Istanbul or to Egypt to pursue higher Islamic education. So we invited this professor in 1992 to help us. And he, he helped us and we established the Department for Religious Education Pedagogy at our faculty. And we started to educate religious teachers. What is what, why uh, his name is important for us? Because he started to write down in his general pedagogy books about this topic. And he started to argument, to argue and to, to make arguments why religious education is completely relevant. And it is one of the main uh, areas, educational areas to be developed to be developed in humans, in personalities. He has written many articles and he helped us a lot. And his books are read not only at our faculty, but also at some other secular universities in the region, in Croatia, in Serbia, in Bosnia. And he came up with such great uh, arguments. For example, this is his classification. Universal valid values, truth, beauty, justice, kindness, and holiness are the universal values. Holiness, holiness is the value that contains all the values. <clears throat> and he argues that these universal valid values, among them holiness, should be coordinates 
of the upbringing and educational processes. Pedagogical norms, as he states, and educational goals are based, or should be based on these values. So they're called fundamental values. If any of those components are missing in the learning teaching process, the entire personality suffers and this leads not only to the anthropo anthropological reductionism, but also to the value disorientation of the individual. Pedagogy of men, from a human being of learning to a learning society. It was published in 2023 and we had promotion, book promotion recently at the faculty. Religious education promotes these universal valid values. And this religious upbringing does not allow these values to be relativized. Relativization of the universal val values leads to the gradual decay of the concept of education. He states further, if educational upbringing theory is not based on universally valid values, truth, goodness, beauty, justice, and holiness, then moral impoverishment and desolation will occur to human souls. This kind of alienation and dehumanization should be prevented by authentic, authentic upbringing. When my students ask me, what is authentic, authentic upbringing? versus instrumental upbringing. Would you know maybe that? What is the difference between authentic and instrumental education or upbringing? <clears throat> authentic upbringing and those values related to authentic upbringing, we could find in the religion, in the family upbringing, and so on, in the moral stories, in the art, and so on. But instrumental upbringing, what we see in the educational systems is prescribed by the establishment. Establishment prescribes the instrumental upbringing and the values related to education. Recently, I was watching one documentary related to the education in Canada. <clears throat> if I'm wrong, someone could correct me, but I understood that, for example, when it comes to the issue of homosexuality, in that educational system, political establishment or the educational establishment, government, authority, educational authority, encourages this homosexuality. It is something which is very normal, they perceive as a very normal in that country, in that educational system, and it is encouraged. And <clears throat> some people in the interview said, for example, uh, we are invited sometimes to go, to come to the school and to share our food people from India, from Malaysia, from Bosnia, from other, you know, uh, countries, different cultures and traditions. And sometimes we are invited to come to the school to come up with the food, our traditional food, and to share this food. And this is very acceptable, you know. It's very easy to share the food. But when it comes to the values which we bring, from our religious traditions, from our cultures and so on, it is not that much, you know, accepted. It is not accepted. Those values in those uh, educational systems in countries and societies are shaped by instrumental, you know, upbringing and values related to that. And one, one uh, parent, uh, told uh, there is there are some days in the schools when uh, parents become letters and they are invited invited to send their kids to the school but 
a female, a female, for example, a kid or a student should be clothed in male clo clothing. And male should be clothed in female clothing. And they are invited to send kids, their kids to the school in such, you know, just opposite clothing. To encourage this uh, homosexuality or, or, or to perceive this as a normal, to promote this as a normal. So this is the main uh, uh, this distinction between authentic, authentic, and instrumental upbringing. When the educational authorities shape that, of course, they would force and shape their values that they appreciate as a values. Once I was participating in one summer school, religion uh, and religious values in public space, it was called some, some, something like that, uh, in England. And there was a professor from Japan, and he was lecturing there. He was arguing that homosexuality is something that's very normal, that's a part of human nature, and so on and so on. And he was very crit critical towards the religious stance on this issue. And <clears throat> after that, I asked him two questions. I asked him, who? Uh, who regulate the moral code of the human humankind? Who regulates that? Who says what is moral and what is unmoral for human beings? Who? Who is that? He told me it's a very hard question. And I asked him again. Maybe this question is a little bit, uh, I'll say, harsh. But I, I felt that I should act on that way. I asked him, excuse me, professor, what would you say if this happens? If this happen, it happens, it's just hypothesis. But if this happens, if a father, for example, who is father and his daughter, if they decide to do uh, incest, they are, you know, mature, they are clever, uh, what would you say? And he said, of course, it is not ac acceptable. It's not allowed. It's, it's not good. And I asked him, yeah, yes, I confirmed that, of course, it's not good. It's not acceptable. But who defines that? He looked at me and he told, I know what are you talking. You're talking about the rel relativizations of the universal valid values which are prescribed by religions and I told him of course if you say that homosexuality is acceptable we we in that case relativize some values prescribed by the religion by faith and you cannot take one value and say of course this, this doesn't last anymore and other values are still respected. You can't do that. All values are universal values and we should respect that. <laughs> he couldn't uh, argue anymore on this topic. Uh, I think that in Islamic studies today, we need, to we need to develop the methodology, better methodology and arguments in dealing with all these issues uh, that come, come in modern societies. <clears throat> Please stop me. I it seems that I prepared too many uh, content, <laughs> too much content to cover today. <clears throat> yes, but I will I will go uh, through some. Uh, you can see if there is nothing sacred, then all is permissible. If we relativize all the universal valid values, then we have this principle. If there is nothing sacred, then all is permissible. Upgrade, upbringing and education must be grounded in culture, culture in faith, and faith in the ultimate 
purpose, God. What would happen if education and upbringing is based only on the culture? It would lead to the ethnocentrism consciousness that doesn't tolerate mutual co coexistence. But if it is based on the culture and on the re religion, we should speak then about the education that it's based on the universal valid values. Of course, there are some other uh, professors, uh, scholars that argued for this education and upbringing that should be based on the religion. I mentioned you Comenius from the 16th century. He also, as a founder of the didactic, he told that youth who don't have a religious upbringing grow without the necessary care, just like a forest that no one plants or waters. But today, pedagogy, uh, secular pedagogy, don't pay much attention to the spirituality and religion. You, you should know that. Effective pedagogy approaches in the affirmation of values. It's the next topic. I think this one, this one will be maybe much easier and a lot of pictures are here. <laughs> what should be effective pedagogy didactic approaches in the affirmation of values? This is my understanding of the topic. We should pay attention in our approaches, pedagogical approaches, in the teaching and learning process, we should pay attention to the critical thinking, creative thinking, and curiosity. Uh, I have read one book that was published here, Creative Thinking and Islamic Perspective, uh, Jamal Badi, Mustafa Taidin, I think the authors. Uh, it is very interesting that the Quran play uh, puts a lot of uh, attention to this topic and Quran encourages us to develop higher thinking processes. You know that some enemies of the Islam they accuse accuses us for indoctrination. What is indoctrination? Indoctrination means manipulation over someone's mind, reason, understanding, uh, and so on. But we can see the Quran pays a lot of inte it, uh, intention of developing higher critical thinking processes and uses different terms like tefekkur, tefekkuh, tedebur nezar, tebesur, tefekkur, iartibar, tebesum, teakkul. Many Quranic verses and with this phrase, Efelaya tefekerun, Efelate tefekerun, Efelaya akirun, Efelata akirun, and so on. Sometimes Quran uses, actually, intellect in Islamic perspective is comprised of reason and heart. Reason and heart. And Quran sometimes uses reason and sometimes uses a heart for understanding. Efelaya tedeberun al Quran. Understanding and heart is mentioned here. Uh, Arazi Mufessir elaborated and he found identified 30 synonyms associated with the term. Uh, those authors that I mentioned, uh, Body and Tidy, listen. Uh, listed and analyzed 15 styles of thinking found in the Quran, creative, critical, emotional, objective, inquisitive, positive, visual, metaphorical, rational, emotional, and so on and so on. Uh, I'm sure you're familiar with this, but I would like to show you this, Bloom's and uh, cognitive and affective taxonomy. And I know that you are familiar with this, but uh, what I would like to emphasize here, when it comes to these classifications of the levels, of the goals in education, what do we see in the first part when it comes to the cognitive part or domain? We see knowledge, basic knowledge, informations. Then we see understanding or comprehension, 
application, analysis, synthesis, and evaluation. They are classified. And in the most educational systems in the world, this Bloom's taxonomy is applied. I, I saw that in the United States, in Europe, most probably here and so on. But this is not the novelty. We find this, not on this way systematically, but we find the idea in the Quran and the Sunnah. For example, you are familiar with the Hadith or Ashab Sahaba reported uh, that they learned 10 ayahs, Quranic verses, they learned by heart. And after that, they they should understood and apply those 10 Quranic verses in order to learn the next 10. The same categorization, learning, understanding, application, and so on. And we saw the many Quranic terms that refer to those higher thinking uh, processes, analysis, synthesis, critical evaluation, and so on. Uh, you have heard about uh, the situation when uh, the Prophet Rasul Muhammad alayhi salam sent Muaz ibn Jabal to Yemen. And he asked him, how are you going to judge? I'm summarizing. I'm going to judge according to Quran. If you don't find that in the Quran, how are you going to judge according to Hadith, to Sunnah? And if you don't find that in the Quran and the Hadith, how do you judge according to my critical knowledge? Of course, I, I just wanted to share my understanding of this with you. I, you are familiar, but this is not the novelty. And we should know these facts. Um, should internalize, internalize the knowledge. Transform educational content into educational goods. What is educational goods? What is the difference between educational content? For example, educational content is the content of Akida, course, Tafsir, Kira, psychology, medicine, and so on. It is educational content. But through our educational approaches and pedagogy, we should transform educational content into educational goods. What, what is educational good? It is actually the educational content when we transform them into educational good. It is the content that changes us in a positive way. We are touched and we are changed, transformed positively. We should cover the content and transfer the content of the knowledge on that way to be educational good, to be, uh, to be supportive, to be stimulative, to be creative, and to respect those higher educational thinking processes. Uh, educational approach, I, I thought that should be supportive and positive transformation. You know, in the pedagogy in general, we find, for example, this classification of pedagogical approaches improving guidance and encouragement, prevention and disciplining and sanctioning. I put this red color here because the emphasis in our educational and pedagogical approaches should be this improving guidance and encouragement. We should this we could discuss about this, you know, for for, for many hours. But we don't have time. Do we find this approach in our educational institutions, in mektebs, in madrasas? Do we find this? Or maybe the attention is paid to sanctioning much more than encouraging. Quranic approach actually is improving guidance and encouragement. And the appro pedagogical approach of the Rasul Muhammad Salam was this one. He was treating people with gentle care. He was advising them with the beautiful, you know, words and so on. Um, I understand that 
Allah's beautiful names, 99 beautiful names, which are mostly the names of mercy and forgiveness. They are they were reflected in the pedagogical approach or educational approach of the Rasul Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and we should accept that and implement this approach in our educational institutions. And now we are teaching, uh, we are talking about didactic approach as an effective pedagogical approach in Islamic education. Uh, I should say. I maybe I should share something with you. Once when I went to Egypt, we were going as students to learn Arabic for 40 days in Cairo. And it was January. Uh, you know that uh, Cairo is very famous for book fair in January. And I was happy to visit that book fair and to find some books about Islamic pedagogy at Terbiya Islamia. And I went to the book fair and I was looking. I found some books, but I was disappointed because almost all the books treat the same topics. You know, the same topics, the same, almost the same structure. And I was disappointed. I didn't see anything new. And I should tell you, even though we have some critical stance toward, towards the Western pedagogy, I should say that Western pedagogy is well-developed. And its sub-disciplines, for example, andragogy, didactic, methodology of teaching, uh, family pedagogy, comparative pedagogy, and so on and so on. I studied those uh, academic fields, the general pedagogy. They are well developed. They know how to, how to work with talented kids, how to work with the, with the kids with special needs, and so on and so on. And we didn't develop that. I think it's our problem. We we have developed some concept, theoretical concept, but not practical. So uh, this didactic approach, I think, should be implemented in our religious studies. I will show you some strategies, methods. Most probably you are familiar with some of them. For example, inside the lecture format, we could apply many, many different methods. Uh, in pedagogy and in the didactic, we call these methods methods active learning methods. Active learning methods. We have those class, classical methods, oral communication, textual method, and so on and so on. But we have those active learning methods as well, <clears throat> such as short discussions in pairs, in larger groups, use of tutorial groups, quizzes, writing reflections on learning. For example, if I lecture my students, in the middle of my lecture, I could ask for the reflection, written reflection, or at the end, students' presentations, role play, we apply this. <clears throat> Student producing mind maps. Are you familiar with mind maps? I'll show you some, some examples. Uh, independent project, teamwork, debates, practicals, writing media articles, portfolio development, and so on. There are so many. Seminars. Do you know what are seminars? Seminars. Do you apply that here? I saw this. This is dominant approach in the United States. They don't lecture like we lecture all the time. We speak. You know, we interact. We have interaction. But they do seminars. Professor gives some introduction. And after that, they discuss in groups. Of course, they had they have to come prepared for the discussion. They have they have to come prepared. Uh, I saw that students uh, students read approximately three hundred uh, to from three hundred to five five hundred pages for one week. From one week to another, <clears throat> they they read approximately four hundred pages. And when I say that to my students, they don't believe me. <clears throat> they tell, Professor, you ask too much. <laughs> but believe me, those students, maybe you have something, some similar experience, I don't know, you can share with me. But I witnessed that. I was a part of that. They, they read a lot. Even they read and discuss about that content 
or, or they work on some mini, pro, mini projects from week to another week. They develop one project, small project, and they present that project. And it goes from one week to another. They work a lot. Uh, within this format, seminars. Uh, seminars are also pre present in Germany. It's a part of their educational system as well. So many methods. And this is one master thesis that we developed at our faculty. I was mentor, project-based learning as a creative model of teaching in Islamic religious education. You can see the student. Of course, this is in Bosnian language. We don't teach in English. We have one uh, study program, uh, Islam in Europe, in English. But other study programs are in Bosnian language. We hope to develop some study programs, more study programs in English and Arabic. You can see this is a method, project-based learning, but applied into teaching of Islamic religious education in public schools. And this student developed some projects and implemented. You can see the whole procedure, first grade project with first grade pupils. It's good to be good to nature. And she combined three teaching units. Faith teaches me nature is a gift from God, creator Allah. And these are activities that she did with her students. Storytelling, photographing, making and publishing a picture book, a good city project discussion, and so on. You can see the whole process, very creative. And this is implemented in public school. Class picture book they developed within this project with first grade pupils, first grade, a good city. They developed the story, pupils with teacher about good city and transformed that into class picture book. The fourth grade project was, it is good to share knowledge. You can see these teaching units. Idris, peace be upon him, alayhi salam, writes with a pen. Nuh, alayhi salam, builds a ship. Components of Salah. The differences among people as a sign of God's grace. These are teaching units. And these are activities. Workshop, storytelling, scopiling, and editing a picture book, printing a picture book, and project discussion. And the third project with nine grade project, nine grade students, it's good to be good to others. And they developed humanitarian action within this project. Teaching units, meaning of life, God is my cho choice, leaning values between good and evil. And you can see the whole project. Nine grade students developing project with teacher, prophetic books, making didactic material, parts of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You can see this didactic book, prophetic box. They wrote some hadiths, some messages from the uh, Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and it was very creative. It was one part, just part of the project. But this is the art of teaching and learning. You can see this method of identifying similarities and differences. And we can apply this also. For example, the topic about the prayers. On Venn's diagram, the difference between Christian and Muslim prayer, simil similarities and differences. You know, it's not easy for the kids to to identify, first of all, they have to have knowledge, information, and after that, they should contrast, separate, find similarities, differences, and so on. Look at this table. Look at this table, please. Matrix. I adopted this method from one book in English, Effective Teaching Strategies, written by Robert Marzano. I don't know whether you heard about this uh, scholar. He has written many, many books on this topic, Robert Marzano. 
the scholar in the United States. And I adopted from one of his books this method, comparison metrics. You can see this is very complex. The topic or the teaching unit is religious holidays. But we have so many religious holidays. Eid al-Fitr, Eid al-Adha, Christmas, Orthodox Catholic, Easter, Orthodox Catholic, Shabbat, Pesach, Hanukkah, and so on. And we compare some characteristics for each of these uh, religious holidays. For example, holiday time. And what are the similarities and differences when it comes to the holiday time for each of these? It's very complex for now. For now, for us now, at this moment, it would be very complex to fill in this. Duration of the holiday, what is celebrating? I saw last night this uh, religious holiday, uh, Deepa Valley, Deepa Valley. <laughs> you have that. You can adopt also this matrix and, and teach your children or pupil students in high school. This is for high school students. Fasting, prayer, customs, tradition, food. You can see this is very complex, but we can make this table easier or more complex. It depends what do we want at, at that moment. You can see this is also related to the effective domain. We should not forget moral effective domain when we teach. This is one, just one example. I developed this with my students because I prepare my students uh, to teach in the schools, you know, and they they go on student internship or practicum. I think you call that practicum. We also call that practicum. I prepare them. They develop three teaching preparation with all these elements and they go and teach students in the school or in the kindergarten. So I observe this, I, I follow them and I observe the results. So you can see the Surah El Ma'un. In one moment, in one part of the lecture, we give this task to the students and pupils. We prepared hammer paper, heart shaped, heart shaped. One is black, one is white, why? Of course, the main theme topic in this surah is deeds, about good deeds or bad deeds, bad deeds of people who deny the day of judgment. And we would, would like to didactically shape this because the kids like these things. You know, they learn by heart and they understand the, the message of the surah easier. So we prepared this heart, white heart, black heart, and so on. But we prepared also those small uh, paper sticks to white and black sticks. And they were asked, after, of course, we analyzed surah and the meaning of surah and so on, we asked them to write down the characters, characteristics of good people, of believers on the white papers, on those sticks, white sticks, and we also asked one group to write down the characteristics of bad people or bad deeds of people who deny the day of judgment. How do they behave? And they were writing that on the black sticks. After that, we asked them to go to the table and to stick those, but white to the black heart and black to the white heart. Why? 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 What do you think? Hmm? Clean heart back. Great, great. Thank you very much. It means that people who do bad things, their hearts become black because of the sins. And those people who, who do good deeds, even though at the moment they, they are not good believers, and they start to believe, to implement values, to develop Islamic values, their hearts become white because we still have to promote this uh, pedagogical optimism. Actually, it was approach, uh, prophetic approach, optimistic approach. We should believe that positive transformation would come at the end. We always have to that 
ha we have to have that in our mind when we approach to people, to kids. We have to believe in this positive transformation. And we know, we all know that Allah accepts our niya uh, until the end of our life. Niya. Okay. A tale stories is a teaching method. Also, we implement this. This is very nice uh, picture book, Haful Hayavanat. It was published during the war time in Bosnia Herzegovina with the support of Qatar Society, charitable society. We also use visual methods, media, movies, cartoons, pictures, and so on. This is minding maps as a method. Uh, those books are very famous. And very good books, I can tell you. Sometimes we can use this method. For example, I would suggest some topics when it comes to the Islamic history or when it comes to the seerah of the Prophet, Rasul Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We could uh, draw the mind map, you know, cl classify those three basic periods of his life and extract the main things, you know. It is very systematic, well-structured. It could be well-structured. It also help, uh, helps us when we do some lectures. It's very systematic. It could help us. Uh, this is from the German uh, uh, textbook. I can tell you that they have very good illustrations and very good uh, task for students, for pupils. Very stimulating. We don't have time to. This is very interesting story. I will tell you if I have, if I have, if I have time. Uh, a story about a religious teacher Mualim, who who is teaching in one of Boston maktabs. He invent, invented something very interesting. He took those fluorescent colors, put them into water and ask pupils in the maktab to take wudu with this water. Of course, they didn't notice any change when it comes to the color of the water. The color of the water remained uh, the same. After that, when they took wudu, he brought them to the darkened uh, classroom. And when they entered, the parts of the body, uh, washed parts of the body were shining. And it was very emotional, and he told them, Inshallah, who takes wudu and pray, he will be shining at the day of judgment. You know, it was very, very motivational. Uh, acting method we also implement in our religious education teaching. And this is one, just one example, puppet show. Good deeds, visit a sick friend. I'll show you the photo of my student on practicum in the school, this is my student. You know, we don't need that much financial uh, support to be inventive and creative. She took only two plastic gloves. One glove is for one person, for one child, she, she was acting. For example, one is Ilma, another glove is Ismail. And the whole conversation was under this box. You can see the kids, they, they were very motivated, very curious. They stood up and were looking, were observing what was going on. Uh, learning centers in Sarajevo kindergarten. We don't have religious education in all state kindergartens in Bosnia and Herzegovina. It, it is just a pilot project. It is in some kindergartens. In Sarajevo public kindergarten, we do have, but not, not everywhere in Bosnia and Herzegovina. But, and we try to do our best, you know, to show that we could have religious education for preschool kids. For now, it goes well, you know. I also prepare my students to do practicum in kindergartens. You can see it's very, I hope you like this picture. <laughs> rule play, rule play as a teaching method. For example, the Rasul Musa alayhi salam, uh, I have video, but I don't have time to show. My student 
is acting and uh, pupils in Mekteb or in the school. Uh, one has a role of Pharaoh, Pharaoh, <laughs> but it's very important that child or kid don't act that role. Teacher act that role, bad, you know. Uh, we should be very sensitive. And one child is, for example, he is acting Musa, salam, another child is acting uh, Harun, his brother. Another kids are acting uh, those uh, magician, magicians who, you know, who praise God and the end and so on. It's a whole scenario. And it's, it could be very, very interesting. I will show you one, one more example, but this is not good example. Um, we have some stu Bosnian students who study in Islamic countries, you know. And of course, I respect them. I respect their studies, the content they learn there. But uh, we realized that those students who come from Islamic countries and who studied there, they didn't develop didactic field, you know. They had some uh, knowledge about Islamic pedagogy, those theoretical concepts, when it comes to the art of teaching, very bad. So they come to Bosnia and they would like to work in the school, in the public school. And they didn't have didactics, methodology of teaching and, and other pedagogy, general pedagogy. They didn't have that. And we have problem. So we came to the conclusion at our faculty in order to get those diplomas recognized because they should be recognized at uh, our faculty, uh, it is the demand of the Islamic community. They should be recognized at our faculty. In order to get diplomas recognized, uh, we put some preconditions. They should master those general pedagogical subjects and some other subjects. So they should go through this. Before that, we have those problems. I'll show you. This is a student, I, I will not tell you at which university he was studying. You know, it would not be nice here to say that. But um, this lecture was given at high medical school, high medical school. And the topic was very good, very interesting. Family, oasis of healthy aging and happy life. Very good topic, you know, to be developed. But look at the tasks which he, he gave to the students, high school students. Uh, those tasks were predicted to last 20 minutes, to be, you know, realized, implemented in 20 minutes. And he has three groups. Look at those tasks. One group. Uh, he gave, of course, some introduction, but he told them they will give one hadith or one Quranic verse written, and they should answer to some questions. Look at the hadith and those questions. Three people will not enter paradise. The one who is disobedient to his parents, the woman who imitates men, and the... the uh, I forgot what is this. Oh, doesn't matter. Uh, we will check out later on. The third category is which one? Diso disobedient or something like disobedient, yeah. And, you know, they received the hadith written on the paper and they got three questions. What does this hadith tell us? What are the three types of people who will not enter paradise? Which of these three types is most important to us? Believe me, those kids answered in five or three minutes, three or five minutes, it was finished because the questions were not stimulated. It was just, they just needed to repeat, to memorize, to repeat, that's all. Without analyze, synthesis, without creative thinking, nothing. They finished within five minutes, the rest of the time they were laughing. They couldn't stop laughing. And you know, this student was confused. You know, he was in a bad position because he didn't know what was going on. But he didn't realize that his preparation was not good. 
So after that, we realized that we have to change something. The role of higher education. Yes, we will have some questions. Projects on values at our faculty, for example, we developed uh, and implemented some projects on values. I mentioned this project, Bazinji project. Uh, we cooperate with IUM, Shenandoah, Bridgewater, and Sarajevo University. I have developed one project with my students and professor from Shenandoah University and her students, PhD students. Uh, this topic was intercultural and interreligious values in college education programs, higher education institutions in the United States in Bosnia Herzegovina. We were developing this project for one year. Another year, we developed another project. And I hope after these meetings that we will be able, you know, to cooperate with your students, my students. We, I hope, to this. Inshallah. Um, this is uh, so-called uh, COIL, Collaborative Online International Learning Project. Uh, these are ped pedagogical approaches also very useful. I have learned this from those professors from the United States, and we implemented some at the Sarajevo University, reflective structured dialogue in classroom. And also a town hall approach. This is very interesting approach. Students with mentors from different academic disciplines, for example, Islamic discipline, medical, uh, law and so on, they cooperate together and they, they develop one project together. After that, they present uh, in a town hall, city town hall, their projects. It's a huge event. Groups present their projects on social issues that we choose, you know, to, re to do research. And also they invite someone who is a uh, a specialist, some experts from the community, from the community, consultants. So they advise students on this topic and so on. This is very interesting. We will try to implement this in Sarajevo. Uh, in Sarajevo, you can see in June we received the, the vice vice provost from Shenandoah University and the dean. They gave us the lectures on this topic. It's a very interesting pedagogical approach that we could implement in higher Islamic education. Research and the publications of academic verse on values. I recently uh, published this article, Contribution of Islamic Religious Education to Intercultural Values in Pluralistic European Cultures, Insights from Bosnia and Herzegovina. For me, it was very important to show the to show to this Western academic community and and further, that we teach Islamic religious education in a way that's very inclusive, promoting so many intercultural and interreligious values through our curricula and our projects. Uh, I analyzed our curricula at our faculty and curricula for religious education that is taught in public schools. And I showed it in this article, so many topics uh, in, for example, Islamic law courses, study of religion, teaching Judaism and Christianity, uh, and so on, so on, pedagogical courses. You can see we have also some projects related to intercultural values. For example, faith in peace building, Meeting of the Young Theologians. This is picture that shows this meeting of young theologians, Islamic theologians, Orthodox theologians, Catholic, and so on. These young people meet and discuss. It's important. Um, we also have one joint master study program named Interreligious Studies and Peace Building. And we do this master program together with Catholic Theological Faculty and Orthodox Theological Faculty in Bosnia and Herzegovina. It's a current pro study program. We do that together. Uh, we also have something uh, that promote uh, through our academic works and master thesis, doctoral thesis, 
For example, this master, master project, excuse me, oh, not time, no, don't have time to, to talk about this, but this is also an article that I did with my colleague, the influence of dormitory schools, religious and secular, on students' values and students' uh, behavior and value orientation. It's a very interesting study. St uh, 867 students from different Bosnian cities uh, were sampled, and we did research in madrasas, in Orthodox seminary, Franciscan monastery, and so on. And we came up with this very interesting conclusions. The type of school uh, plays a very important role in terms of the uh, values and value orientations. Those students who attend secular schools, they are much more close to hedonistic value orientation than those students who attend uh, religious schools. It's very interesting. And there are many other conclusions, but not enough time to discuss about this. This is also master thesis that we developed at our faculty. I was mentoring this. Possibilities and influence of Islamic religious education on the values and behavior of Sarajevo elementary school, school students. Uh, the student who did master thesis, he was the director of the school, of one of the public schools in Sarajevo. And we used this moment to implement values in the school. And you can see there is a direct connection between this master thesis and school project. It's a call to be human and love country. This project was developed in the school and lasted uh, 100 days. During 100 days, 100 activities promoting 100 values. It was great, you know. And you can see the students, for example, uh, implemented this project. It's cool to be good. It's cool to love your country. They visited National Kitchen uh, to serve uh, poor people. They visited the Service Center for Children and Families with de de Developmental Disabilities. Give us a chance. They organized humanitarian bazaar, which, which was held at the school where the students collected money for the migrants. We, at that time, we had many migrants, you know, from Morocco, Afghanistan, Iran, Iraq, and so on. So they collected some money and they helped. You can see there is a photo uh, about. Uh, they were helping migrants on the streets. So we try to implement and connect our academic words with some projects in promotion and affirmation of the values. So I think this will be enough <laughs> for today. Uh, maybe one more thing. I think in our context, it's important to uh, try to have an impact on the state secular universities concept. So uh, I got a chance 10 years ago to teach at the university academic staff from all other faculties, medical faculties, uh, natural studies, uh, all, all other faculties. So they come teaching assistants, senior teaching assistants, professors, and so on, associate professors. Uh, this is a project lifelong learning related to uh, pedagogy and didactics. So uh, this project is held three times per year, and we have uh, uh, groups, different groups. Every group is different, you know, and I teach with my colleague this uh, these modules, didactics of higher education and curriculum design in higher education. I have a chance and I have insights into many curricula at the university, from the medical faculty, from the faculty of law, chemistry, uh, pedagogy, psychology, social work, and so on. And what I realized, I realized that they miss in their curricula learning outcomes, intended learning outcomes related to moral ethical domain. You know, you can see only the cognitive domain, the topics that force, teach, learn, cognitive domain, informations. But those 
planned learning outcomes or goals related to ethical domain are not found there. So I pay attention to that and I advise them, motivate them to include those topics related to ethical moral domain. Uh, when, the last slide. Our role in media. <laughs> when I was invited to have media appearance here, first of all, I told my schedule is very tight, uh, tight as it is very tight, four lectures, several meetings and so on. But I couldn't refuse. I accepted that. It's very important that we play a role in the media. We have to get that space, you know, especially in some, you know, countries, uh, cultures, societies, to have an impact. Uh, during the last Ramadan, I was uh, presenting one topic in the media, TV, and I was telling in one moment that we need much more educational programs for children, parents, and young people in media, because we can see the dominant topics unfortunately, in media are negative and negative informations. And it affects all of us. So I told we need we need to have much more educational programs for children, young people. You can put that and on social media and to influence young people with those uh, educational programs. When I came home and I was uh, watching that uh, video, I realized that something was missing in my speech. And I realized they cut my speech uh, in that moment when I in which I was speaking that we need more educational programs. So and they understood it as a critique. <laughs> and uh, I came up also with the idea that we should have students practicum in media. We haven't started yet, but we are planning to do that. Thank you very much for your attention and your patience. Thank you very much. I'm really grateful. Maybe I uh, it took a lot of uh, your time, but I saw it was predicted to give lecture two hours with the interaction. So if you have yeah. some questions, comments, I would be very happy to interact with you. Thank you. Thank you. We're so honored to have you here. And um, because of the constraint, constraint of time, uh, we will open to questions. The floor to questions, maybe to one, two questions before we end the session. Please. Asalaamu As Alaikum, ma'am. I'm Saima Ali, a PhD scholar from Pakistan. First, uh, I really appreciate your effort and uh, what I realized throughout your presentation and whatever you uh, share here, that all the crucial times, all time, every time, everywhere, all their crucial times, uh, when the values are tested, uh, when the innovations are often uh, flourish and adversity has a unique ability to spark these all kind of creativity, pushing individuals and societies mm -hmm. to create more something uh, shining and um, uh, create solutions and principles of values. I see this throughout your presentation and it's really appreciated. Pakistan is the country by name of Islam the one of the country. Uh, but unfortunately, I didn't find any kind of these kind of values that is putting to the in my school time, which you are uh, doing there, uh, crucial time at the Bosnia. I was a child and I uh, listened that news, uh, 90.92 for Bosnia Herzegovina. And uh, uh, I always asked through my father, uh, that uh, what it's happening is that Muslim kids, uh, they are kind of us. So uh, mostly people, when they are living in their situations, they are free. We are in living in the free country and we are protected from any ways. But uh, now the parents didn't answer these questions. They didn't uh, yeah. put their child uh, to uh, and, uh, to understand that crucial moment that is suffering like now. Mm -hmm. Like my son is asking me uh, uh, to me about Palestine. Mm -hmm. So uh, these kind of values also we need to put in our children yes. that they should be brave to face that kind of things, whichever, whatever, uh, wherever they can face due to the religious diversity. And in fact, it's uh, religious diversity uh, which. In your case, it's flourish 
is flourish your values, is flourish your work, and you create a many creative and many good good times and good work. Especially, I just saw sort of a sort of mound. I literally thought that time if I learned that in my childhood like that, whatever the values put in myself, mm -hmm. and if we also adopted it in our schools, it's really putting that what that would would be create, what would the product we produce from that schools. I love to work with that uh, uh, children which are um, product of that Bosnia because I understand that they have much more knowledge than me. And they are more valued than me. And uh, congratulations for that. And uh, just uh, the beside me, uh, it's Adam Musa, the uh, uh, currently elected president of Stuck Student Society. He told me that we should ask uh, you uh, for the publications also. Okay. And also, uh, do you give the idea to us about the 100 days? <laughs> Thank you for that. Thank you very much for your beautiful Thank you. comments. Uh, you know, my tears came when you mentioned this moment from 1992 1995 thank you for all comments but yes it was very good. thank you ma'am. of course i will share my publications that are in english with all of you i will send maybe sure. to your professor and you can share with uh, some people who are interested in to, uh, to read some of the articles we are still developing this you know field when it comes to the methodology of teaching religious instruction I have been doing that for many years and still haven't uh, developed textbook, but I am planning, you know, to do that. It takes time. If you would like to, to prepare something that's very serious, well-established, it takes time. <laughs> Sure. I add something that, uh, that some all that kind of things which are uh, doing this, but not in the name of uh, Quranic or Islamic education, but from the Western philosophy, all that kind of thing which are doing in our, in our institutions that uh, uh, role plays, theater, and but not in the name of Quran and not uh, uh, taking that that text for the theater for the Quran, from the Quran. It's a brilliant idea because in our country. Uh, uh, here are my fellows are here and some of them uh, from the uh, Islamic education. The Islamic education influenced like a rigid education. Mm -hmm. The liberal people don't like to send their child to the, any kind of Islamic education. Because uh, when you talk about that one person playing uh, the role of Hazrat Musa and one person, it's literally a prohibited to talk about that and we portray on the theater. It's a matter of honor killing. <laughs> you will make you will make the change, inshallah. Inshallah, Please, inshallah, Instagram. under your guidance, <laughs> because now we have the role model of that. Okay. That Bosnia is doing this. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, thank you for such an enlightening session uh, for all of us, and uh, I suppose for Istak and uh, the others who would benefit from your. Uh, experience and your methodologies uh, and your pedagogies. I, I would like to perhaps uh, link uh, Yugoslavia, I mean the former Yugoslavia. Mm -hmm. uh, former Yugoslavia. Uh, uh, some similarities with Malaysia mm -hmm. uh, with regard to the experience of uh, Islamic education. Mm -hmm. You said uh, 1500, 1400, mm -hmm. uh, it would be about 500 years. Mm -hmm. And there were certain periods of disruption uh, in, in, in the in history and also uh, during the communist period. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's interesting to see how you have uh, uh, projected uh, uh, a way in which I think uh, perhaps also in Islamic countries, we don't have that kind of uh, curative uh, way of uh, looking at Islam and education. Mm -hmm. And uh, what you, you have done uh, should be beneficial to our teacher training colleges and our Islamic studies uh, in the universities. Uh, I think you know that uh, ISTAC is uh, mm -hmm. in the process of uh, looking into the domain of Islamic studies in mm -hmm. Malaysia. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I, I have been advocating that we look into other societies and mm -hmm. other nations and uh, we can learn. Uh, much from uh, your experience in Bosnia and, and perhaps also it's interesting to see how uh, yourself uh, in your society has inherited uh, the complexities of uh, studying Islam 
uh, in schools and the universities. I think there's something that that uh, that uh, we can adopt uh, in terms of looking at it from outside of your society, and and uh, uh, we 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 look at Islam, we look at the teaching of Islam, and we look at the Islamic studies from from an external perspective, external to yes. what we experience in Malaysia. Yeah. Thank you very much. I thank you very much. I came here to learn, you know, to learn. I would like to find some books that I saw uh, that they were published by IAM related to religious education. I would like to collect all of them, you know, to read, just to have an idea what's going on in this part of the world. And I know that you have been producing good books uh, uh, when it comes to the concept of Islamic education, and you are trying to integrate some of the topics that I'm interested in. Um, I'm trying to see what's going on in the United States when it comes to those approaches. What's going on in Germany? I was learning German, and I was on uh, mother, mother, you say? Mother, mother leave, maternity oh, leave, maternity leave, maternity leave. <laughs> I have two children, eight and five, and I was on maternity leave. I had, I, I knew some German, but for me it was not enough. And I will tell you one, one more thing. We really appreciate foreign languages at the faculty. We have lectures for German language because we have cooperation of agreement between uh, Germanistic Institute. In, in Austria, in Wien, and they come in semest uh, summer semester to teach us, for us who would like to learn, you know. And we also have Fulbright scholars who teach uh, English, our students practice with them, and we have Arabic uh, foreign le lectures, mostly from Egypt. I knew some German, and pedagogy that we teach, general pedagogy in Bosnia, uh, relies on pedagogy in Germany. It's that tradition. So I needed to learn German to read German books also. And I went to the Goethe Institute in Sarajevo. At that time, many people, unfortunately, many people even now in Bosnia are leaving the country. They are going to Germany, to Slovenia, some other Western European countries to work there. At that time, I went to learn German, and I was asked, like all other participants, why do you learn German? And I told, because I love languages. Because of that, I, I learned German, and I would like to read books in German. They started to laugh. All of them laughed, because they were very pragmatic. Rest of them, they wanted to get visa, and they needed to pass one, you know, level of German language. So I'm trying to get insights into what's going on in the United States, in the German speaking countries when it comes to the pedagogy, didactics, and theology also. In Malaysia, I hope that I will oh, I, I will learn, I'm sure I will learn some things and stay in connection with you. Okay, I think uh, that's all for today. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Dina, for having um, for having us today and um, you for being our guest speaker for today. And before that, um, we would like to give a little bit of appreciation from ISLEC IIUM. So we'd like to invite mm -hmm. Professor Murad Merican uh, to give. Thank you very English. much. Thank you very much all. I hope to meet you again. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your presence and for the present and presence. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Okay. You are very careful. Thank 
Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, we take a uh, photo session before ending. Uh, I'm here always for 